and two great men tonight. Now let's talk more about what Rune Arledge and Stuart Scott meant to our industry and to them. I'd like to introduce our panelists. A veteran play-by-play -play announcer and color commentator, one of the few to have worked college football, basketball, hockey, minor league baseball, that's the NFL, NHL, NBA. He's been the voice of the Nashville Predators since their inception in 1998. And he's here this weekend as NSSA's Tennessee Sportscaster of the Year. For the third time, please welcome, complete with new left shoulder, Pete Weber. <laughs> A Norfolk, Virginia native and Old Dominion University graduate, our next panelist worked in radio and TV as both a news and sports anchor and reporter. In Norfolk and in Pittsburgh, he is in his 13th year at ESPN, where you see him regularly as a Sports Center anchor. Please welcome Jay Harris. Our next guest was a close personal friend of Stuart Scott's. Dee Dee Mills grew up in Williamston, North Carolina. You sports guys know that is the hometown of Gaylord and Jim Perry. A UNC Chapel Hill graduate, she worked for 17 years in the communications department with the Carolina Panthers. She's also been very involved in the local community, and after she became a single mom by adopting her son, Cannon Bahailu, from Ethiopia in 2008, she left the Panthers four years ago. At that time, she started the Bahailu Academy, an arts-based youth development program that implements a holistic approach to empower underserved teens to find their voice if that wasn't enough, Dee Dee bought a food truck in 2012. In 2013, she opened two restaurants, all of which helped to financially sustain the Bahailu Academy. She has been to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, enjoys traveling, attempting golf, that's her word, coaching and watching her son play sports, and she says she's addicted to independent movies and television dramas. Please welcome Dee Dee Mills. During Stuart Scott's stint as a news reporter at WRAL-TV in Raleigh, he used to hang out in the sports department with guys like Tom Suter, Bob Holliday, and our next panelist. He started at RAL as a sports intern in 1985 and left only for a brief time to decide that Cleveland was too cold. Now the WRAL sports director and our co-sportscaster of the year from North Carolina, please welcome Jeff Gravely. Last but not least, our final panelist, also worked with Stuart Scott many years ago at ESPN, now a senior writer at ESPN The Magazine. You can also hear him on ESPN Radio Podcasts, and I think he's been interviewed for every 30 for 30 that ESPN has produced. He's one of the NSSA board's newest members. Please say hello to Ryan McGee. And our moderator tonight is familiar to ACC fans up and down the East Coast and beyond. He has served as a sports reporter and anchor in Montgomery, Birmingham, Charlotte, and Greensboro, and for many years as sideline reporter and play-by-play -play announcer for ACC games and other shows on Raycom and Fox Sports South. He just earned his master's degree from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and will start as a professor teaching sports communication at Catawba College in August. Please welcome Mike Hogwood. Michael. Thanks a lot. Good evening, everybody, and uh, distinguished panel here. We are going to talk about, you've seen the video of these uh, people who made such an impact, and they made an impact in different ways. Of course, Stuart Scott of our modern generation redefined the term sports anchor. And Rune Arledge, you know, TV sports wouldn't be sports if it wasn't uh, the way it is today without him. Rune Arledge uh, was famous of saying in television, we no longer bring the game to the viewer, we take the viewer to the game. And that certainly was uh, his philosophy. And as we, I want to talk about Rune Arledge, and we'll start down there with Pete. Um, you know, we, we heard on there about his technological uh, advances. He started what we now know as a cart camera with a Jeep running up and down the sidelines of football games and was the first to do handheld. What do you think of Rune Arledge's impact? Well, it's absolutely incredible. And, and one of my friends had to, as the legacy of Rune Arledge, had to follow and carry the cable up and down the sidelines at a Vanderbilt game, and he wasn't paying attention, and it got caught up in the cart, and the cable was being rent from the camera, 
and the shot was almost lost immediately. So I know that he felt Rune's impact very much with a very red face uh, right after all of that. Difficult for him. But what he did do, he, all, he taught us all that we're not sitting in our living room and just sort of absorbing. We are getting stories told to us as the audience. And I don't think that really was done by anybody before him, with the exception of the guys on radio like Red Barber. Yeah. And you know, the other thing, and anybody can comment on this, is talent. You know, today, and you guys know who, this, who work for teams, if the team doesn't improve you, if the ACC, John Swafford, doesn't say, Hogwood's okay, you're not, do it. you're not doing the games. Rune Arledge said, no, none of you are going to tell me who to hire, period. I'm going to hire who I want to hire, and people like Howard Cosell were uh, put on despite what people said, and I think that's a big part of his legacy, don't you? Well, maybe he was put on because of that, yeah. because Rune was, I think it's fair to say, a contrarian, and he wanted to show, number one, who was going to be running the show, as much as Pete Rozelle had a little difficult time for a while with Howard, but later on, who was trying to calm Howard down and tell him not to retire? Pete Rozelle. So right. that was, a, it's just how you perceive everything, absolutely. You know, and, and we hear a lot about the NCAA today. He had his own issues with the NCAA because they didn't particularly want all this stuff that he was doing. And if you remember, some of you aren't old enough, but like the Chris Schenkel games on ABC where the players would go, hi, I'm Pete Weber, quarterback, Nashville, Tennessee. And the next guy would come in. He wanted you to see what these guys looked like with their helmets off, you know? <laughs> And, it's, uh, and that was, that was Rune Arledge, part of it. And you, you talk about the recognizing talent. I wrote a piece for ESPN.com a year ago. It was the 50th anniversary of the Indy 500 on ABC, which is second only, I think, to the Masters on CBS. And talked to Bob Goodrich and talked to Don Olmeyer and these people that started as gophers and just would follow that wild world of sports circus around because they wanted to meet Rune Arledge and they wanted to work in sports television. And he would recognize who the kids were that he thought, all the way down to the PAs, he would say, all right, this is who I think should be working with us now. And Bob Goodrich might be the greatest sports director of all time. You know, and, and Don Olmeyer you know, took that baton and, and carried it even further after Arledge had moved on to news. So it was an ability to recognize talent, not just when it came to the Howard Cosell's little world, but also the guys pulling the cables and putting on the microphones and, and you know, editing the pieces. Bigger. And and to follow up on that, my sister-in-law Diane was a camera operator for ABC Sports during Wild Water Wild World World of Sports, uh, the Olympics and everything like that. And she talked. She's told many a story about the pressures of going into an event, knowing that Rune had his eyes on what you were doing. It wasn't just the talent, as you said. It, it, it's the production. You because it's a visual medium. And what he did was wanting to make it more enticing to visualize the slow motion replays, the angles that you had never seen before. And my sister-in-law just talked about how she was petrified as a camera operator going into the Olympics knowing that Rune Arledge knew which camera she was on <laughs> and knew every move that she made. But to this day, she has Emmys lined up against her wall because of Rune Arledge and it wasn't the pressure that he put on him, but the opportunity that he provided. I think, yeah, if you don't mind, because I'm, I'm too young to know any of the specifics behind <laughs> Rune Arledge. Okay, <Yeah>. Jake. <laughs> no, just taking it from a, a viewer standpoint, when I was a kid, uh, my role of sports Saturday afternoon was appointment television. Mm -hmm. right. And Monday Night Football became appointment television. Rune Arledge was a master storyteller. Not just, they're not talking about the written word or the picture, he just, every piece of the puzzle fit and he was he knew where pieces should go and you just felt that you didn't know what you were feeling you just knew you were watching something and it was good and it was compelling and you're gonna sit there and watch it because you just something just made you want to watch it and that was him I don't know how he did it when, when everybody tonight watched the skier come down the slope we all knew we had seen that a thousand times yeah. right yeah. but that's the kind of image that he wanted to capture and it was one of those frozen moments in time that that will live in infamy. And I think he is, should be commended for so many of those um, images and visuals that, that we all live with as sports fans. You guys talk about him having the finger on the pulse of what was going on. 
some interesting stories and they deal with the red phone. There was a red phone in every truck and that was Rune's phone. And if it rang, you better answer it. And he had control. We don't have any of those today. I can tell you, Pete and I, we work for the same people out of Atlanta. Uh, Randy Stevens, Todd Menhen at Fox Sports South. Heaven help us if they ever get a red phone. But, yeah. Yeah. you know. And, I had a red phone, though, when I worked at the Forum in Los Angeles. It was okay. the Jack Kent Cook phone. Really? And it would ring during the middle of broadcast. We couldn't wait to be out east to the Eastern Time Zone on weeknights when our games were tape delayed to Southern California because then he couldn't tell us how stupid we were with, it, with any immediacy anyway. You know, a, a lot of you, some of you are involved in editing in today's technology and television. You know, we edit timeline editing. We, we drag and drop shots and if you don't like something, you take it out and put it back in. I have a friend, some of you may know him, Rick LaCivita, who was a producer at ABC was the executive producer of CBS. He was a segment producer for Wide World of Sports. And he said, in those days, if somebody didn't like something, you had to start over. He said, Rune Arledge had to approve every segment on Friday morning, and they'd worked all week on it. And how many times they had to start over, worked all through the night on Friday nights, Saturday, got it finished, literally a half hour before Wide World of Sports was to go on the air to make the changes that Rune Arledge wanted to make in those pieces. Amazing. And we all benefited We did all benefit did. from Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And those editors benefited from it too. Yeah, you know one of the things that I like, and I'd like you guys to come on this, comment on this too, is we're all in here and we all love sports. Sports is a big part of society today. But Rune Arledge thought that it mirrored society. Sports did. I some comments from you guys if you think about that at all. Well, I, I think about, uh, you know, Chris, became friends with Chris Economaki, uh, maybe the greatest motorsports journalist that ever lived. And Chris had worked with Rune Arledge for years on at Daytona and Indianapolis. And what Chris always preached, and he always said, and this is what Mr. Arledge says, which is, you know, the, it's, there's a, it's not just about the scores, it's about the stories. And that's what you have to try to do. And this was the first person that tried to do that on television. I was watching those World War of Sports clips, and you see the Little League World Series. We should right. not care at all about the Little League World Series. But recently, I left a race at Pocono and drove to Williamsport for a couple hours for no reason other than to look at the empty ballpark. And the reason was because I grew up watching the Little League World Series because he made you care about it. It made you care about the kids. And Ryan, you've been involved in racing for a long time. Think about Wide World of Sports and what it did for NASCAR. Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah, and, it's, and, it was, and it was not just for NASCAR, but for bowling, for Olympic sports, for sports that none of us would ever care about and making you care because it wasn't because you cared about the guy that, that fell off the, the ski jump. It was because, well, who was that guy and what's his story? And that's why it worked. I think the line, the human drama of athletic competition mm -hmm. starts with human and he humanized it uh, in a way that no one had before and I don't think anyone has ever since. And it all came out of a rather informal he getting together with Jim McKay and writing those words down and then coming out which would become part of gospel I think to all of us who had watched or consumed the programs whether now or on or years ago or on YouTube now. You know all of us in our business wonder why we don't get hired for jobs or do get hired for jobs and you never know but Rune Arledge had an amazing ability to select the right talent for a certain event. Uh, Dick Button for figure skating, who was, um, uh, became a good friend. He thought he would be perfect, and he was. And another other talent folks that uh, came on down the line that he hired. Yeah, the only one he really wasn't too high on the quick decision he made uh, for Fred the Hammer Williamson on Monday yeah. Night Football. But yeah. think of all the decisions he did guys make. Like Chris right. And that's the only one you can think yeah. of. Yeah. But willing to take the chance. He did. He was you know, understanding to take the who talent is, but also willing to take the chance. And, and if it didn't work, it didn't work. But, but man, it worked a lot more than it didn't. You know, before we uh, close on Rune Arledge, and they mentioned I'm now a professor at Catawba, so I'm professor mode. I, I do teach in my sports broadcasting class a whole unit on Rune. I think you'd agree he is certainly worth that. But before we move on to Stuart Scott, I'd just like to read what Rune wrote about why we all care about sports. Sports is life condensed. All its drama, struggle, heartbreak, and triumph embodied in artificial contest.
To play a game well, endless practice is required, just as it is in mastering life. Sports always contains the unexpected, a catch that should have been made and wasn't, a bar that should have been leaped and was. It's true in life, chaos often intrudes on the orderly pattern of civilization. Sports can bring tears or laughter in wonderment over its sometime absurdity. I think that was Rune Arledge and uh, uh, certainly a big impact and I think we all agree. I'd like to move now to Stuart Scott. Some on our panel have a personal relationship with Stuart Scott and I don't know if you feel like me but are we missing something in these NBA Finals? Oh, there's no question. I think a year ago, yeah. Stuart Scott was there. Jay, I'd like to start with you and what you think about Stuart and what he meant to this industry of sports broadcasting. I think Stuart made it possible for people to, and I'll tell you a quick story. I had to uh, fill in for him last summer at the uh, Sports Mentor Task Force Breakfast at the National Association of Black Journalists Convention in right. Boston. He was supposed to be the speaker. Due to health reasons, he couldn't do it. So I sent him a text telling him I was, I was going to fill in for him. They'd asked me to fill in. Uh, what does he want me to say to the people? And is there anything, that, um, anything else that he wanted? First, he politely cursed me out via text. <laughs> said I was, I was no blankety blank fill in. Um, tell everybody I wish I could be there and do you. And I remember that every time I go on the air. And I think that's what Stuart did. He allowed us to do us because he did him and be comfortable in doing us. You actually anchored a sports center with him. What was that like, sitting beside him on the set? It was like watching a master class in journalism, not just on the set, watching how he meticulously prepared leading up to the broadcast. Ber not berating. Um, yeah, I use berating. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Researchers to get him the right stat for the right moment in the game to tell the proper story. Um, changing sentences, lead-ins, words. The, we get caught up in the, the booyah and the cooler than the other side of the pillow, but Duke could write. He, he knew his craft. He was a master, and I, just watching that, I was in awe. Amazing. You're gonna hear him call Jeff all weekend. Nobody calls him that. His name is Digger. So, Digger, I'm gonna ask you. You work with Stuart Scott, when he went to WRAL as a news reporter, and I can't imagine him doing a live shot going, wow, folks, this story is as cool as the other side of the pill. I just can't. So how, how was he as a news reporter and, and working with him in the newsroom there? Well, the interesting thing is, is ironically, we did not have any room in our sports department for Stuart Scott. So how many times everybody in this room who works in the media has heard the word no. There's no room in our business. Yeah. There's no room in our inn. I'm sorry, go find another job. Well, he was told at our place, we don't have any openings in sports. So he said, well, what do you have? And they said, well, we have a news reporter's job. And he took it. And my wife was in the business at the same time as a photographer, and she was quite often Stewart's news photographer as they went out on stories. And what he brought was, as Jay mentioned, an unbelievable ability to prepare. No matter if he was covering a car wreck, whether he was covering Jim Valvano, who was on his way out as NC State's coach, whether he was covering a school board meeting, he was going to be prepared. But there was also the unscripted moments of when he was off the camera and he notoriously loved to walk through airports and just fall down just to see how people would react. <laughs> oh, are you all right, son? I'll be all right. Walk into doors, carrying a drink, just to see how people would react. And my wife would sit there. At first, she was all apprehensive, and after a while, she would just let him go. That's just Stuart being Stuart. But, you know, I think the thing that Stuart did was, I'll take what I can, and I'll run with it. He did that at our place, and it wasn't long before the news director at our place went to Orlando that he hired Stewart down there, not as a sports anchor. I've got a sports reporter's job open for you. Would you like it? Absolutely, I'll take it. 
Stewart, from the day he got down there, says, let me anchor a show. Let me, let me be on the air. Let me, let me anchor. Well, we've got this opportunity on Saturday morning if you want to do that, but I'm not paying overtime. It's got to be on your own time. Stewart on his own time sat on the anchor desk in Orlando, Florida on Saturday mornings when I don't know how many people were watching. <laughs> but ESPN was watching. Yeah. ESPN was watching, and it was not soon after that that Stewart was on his way to ESPN to launch ESPN2. But it's a, to me, Stu is the great story of don't worry about where you start, but yep. work to get where you want to go. And I think that's the one thing that he did. And, that's the, and even when he got to where he wanted to go, as big as Stewart was, he never forgot where he came from. And I'll always take that as an unbelievable thing that to his last breath, he remembered me, he remembered my wife, no matter how big he was, he was always going to remember those that helped him along the way. And for that, uh, that's the legacy of Stu. And one more thing, we always hear, booyah, it's booyah, <laughs> booyah, just to make that clear. I asked him about that several times. I said, Stu, they're messing up your line. He said, that's all right. At least they know who says it. Well, I, I, I want to take, so on the timeline, this is where I come in because, and to, to his point about he never forgot you. So I was, they started ESPN2 in October of 1993. I was hired as a production assistant in August of 94, so less than a year. And I came in right after Keith Olbermann had decided ESPN2 was not for him. And the group that came in at the Deuce back then, and we only had about 60 PAs back then, and it was uh, Kenny Main, uh, Stu, uh, Bill Pedo, Reese Davis, who's you know the man now, and uh, it was and, and the PA wise, they hired. The only reason I was hired as a production assistant, I had the worst production assistant interview of all time. I had to wait for a year before they hired me, it's because they expanded the pool because they were starting ESPN too. Well, I come in. And when you worked on the deuce back then, you knew nobody was watching. So we just kind of did whatever. We did this show called Sports Night, and it was more about skateboards and BMX bikes than anything else. And Stu just made that his. And he understood, and you could see it from day one, and drove you nuts as a PA, because your job as a PA is you cut highlights. And you write the shot sheet for the highlights, and you take it to Stu, and Stu's like, well, how many assists did the guy have? I don't know, man. How can you not know that? You cut this highlight, you know, guy had 11 assists. You got to know that. And he already knew. He just was trying to school me. Maybe mad at the time, but he was teaching me something. Well, this was a long time ago. I left ESPN, uh, left, left Bristol, and they moved a bunch of us down here to Charlotte to do motorsports. And uh, I, I left ESPN for a little while, came back. I came back in a totally different role. I had not talked to Stu in 10 years. And he had become a very big deal in the time since I had, had been there and had worked with him on a nightly basis. I was doing a, a live shot from a racetrack somewhere for Sports Center, and I got my earpiece in. And I mean, Janet, he and I've talked this way before. You never even see anybody. I don't see the anchor. I'm just talking. Well, it's Stu. It's on the desk, and they said, "Hey, Ryan, before we come back from break, uh, Stu has a quick question for you." I go, "Okay," and it's a very business-like question. All right, I'm going to ask you this. Is this going to be set up? That's fine. Well, the only two guys from North Carolina at ESPN in 1994 was me and Stu. And our running joke was about, man, if we could just get some hush puppies in the state of Connecticut. There's no hush puppies. That was the only inside joke we had. We had it for about two years. I moved away. You fast forward or whatever. I'm doing this live shot. And I go, Ryan, Stu wants to talk to you. And I'm thinking, he doesn't remember me. He does not know who I am. It's a completely different role I have now. And we go through the whole business of this and that and so and so. And he goes, all right, all right, hush puppies, we're about to come back from break. <laughs> It been 10 years, but, but that reminded me that he knew exactly who I was, but we were going to do the business first, and then he called me afterwards, and we called up. But that was, a, it was an interesting time to be there, and when, when Stu passed, watching all the fantastic tributes, and Jay was such a huge part of all that, but the part that nobody really talked about that much was the resistance that he got in the building. Mm -hmm. It was unbelievable, and it had something to do with the fact that he was an African-American, but it had more to do with his approach to the job. And there were a lot of very frank discussions that took place officially and unofficially of, is America ready for this? 
And it, it was, some of it was very official and some of it was very inappropriate. And Stu knew about all of this and no one knew that he did. And he kept pushing and it was something that I watched and something that I saw on a nightly basis. And um, I, I sit in this building now, this used to be Jeff Gordon's race shop. And when I first started covering NASCAR on a regular basis 20 years ago, Jeff Gordon and Ray Abraham, who you saw in the video, were down at the bottom of the hill, and up at the top of the hill was Terry Labonte. And they were competing for a championship in 1996. Terry Labonte's team was very old school. Bill Armour worked on that team, very old school. This team down here, were do they were doing things, Jay saw this on the immersion, they were doing things nobody ever heard of. And I was interviewing the, Terry Labonte's crew chief, old school guy at the top of the hill, and Ray Abraham had his pit crew yeah. doing calisthenics like it was Paris Island running through the parking lot. And Gary Dehart goes, look at these idiots. Nobody's ever going to do it like this. Now that's how everybody does it. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me so much of the situation with Stu because people would talk about him behind his back and he'd get done doing the sports smash at the top and the bottom of the hour doing highlights and he would leave and everybody just sit there and scream in our little basement and go, oh man, that guy, he's never going to make it. And some of us were sitting there thinking, no, not only is he going to make it, we're all going to be working for that guy one day. Yeah. And that's exactly how it happened. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly what people were saying about him, and he never let it slow him down. Ryan, to that point, Dan Patrick, uh, former ESPN uh, anchor, wrote, his blending of hip-hop with sports casting was unique for television. He didn't just push the envelope, he bulldozed the envelope. Agree? Yeah, and was sincere about it. What people, the way people tried to frame it up was, was that it was phony, and it wasn't phony at all. And, and it, it, that, that was, it was him being him. And, uh, and everybody eventually caught on to that, and that's why he became who he became. And he was ultra competitive in, in that. I mean, he was going to do him just like he told you to do and told me to do a zillion times personally. Um, but he was super competitive. Even in that, the words he used, he was adamant about having more stats in that than, than any other, anybody on the, on the set or having more facts or whatever. He was so adamant and, and competitive in doing that. Steve Levy paid tribute to him at the end of the Super Bowl. Uh, turned to the camera and said, this is Stewart's time and this is the time where he gives the, what we call, I like to call the stew fact. Right. So I'm gonna give the stew fact tonight and thank Stewart and, cause that's what he, you're right. I want, I, want, I want to tell the story better than anyone else is telling the story, and I'm going to use everything at my disposal to do it. But That's he was going to do him yeah. in his way. Didi, you knew uh, Stu as well as any, or perhaps better than anybody on this panel. Talk a little bit about who he was. I know you spoke at his funeral. Tell us a, a little bit about how you got to know him and, and who Stu was. Yeah, he's kind of like a girl. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh my God, he'd kill me for saying that. Um, we actually met, um, I was, I don't know what number of Super Bowl that was that I was working, but I used to work at the Super Bowl every year. And we met at the Atlanta, I like to call it the Ice Super Bowl. That would be the uh, Titans uh, Rams Correct. game. Yeah. It, I think January was 15 <laughs> years ago, that. maybe, yeah. right? Yeah. 15 years ago. Um, so we met then, and we, um, we first started talking about North Carolina, which... You know, years later, people were like, oh, do you know each other from North Carolina? I'm like, no, I'm way younger than he is. So that was always the thing. But we talked about North Carolina um, and just hit it off. And, and, and really, we became that, that night dear, dear, dear friends. Um, but I say he's like a girl. And I think this is why our relationship was, was so great. He would, he's like super tough guy, you know, MMA. And I mean, again, he's competitive like nobody else. But. We would talk. We would talk about the most girl things, like relationships and movies and and TV dramas. And um, he was he was such an in depth. Um, it, you know, I used to always call him the greatest wordsmith, but he was also just the greatest thinker. He was always thinking and always talking about about his thoughts and like, you know, what do you think about this? And what do you think about this? He was super deep super deep so um i miss those conversations so he would call me either before sports center so much or even after um sports center sometimes and and again this is when i started you know was hearing all the um before let me get my makeup done um the whole i just gotta write you know i'm writing 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 and and wanting to get in the 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 stats and the facts 
Um, again, super competitive. But um, so we've, we knew, we've, I've known him for 15 years. And um, yeah, um, that, that whole stuff that you're talking about at first, I was mortified. I was so embarrassed. Mm -hmm. You'd trip and I'd be like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, it was just this thing. And, uh, and you know, after a few times, you're just like, you join it. Exactly. Like you start doing it. That's, That's crazy. Yep. Yeah. That's Stu. We used to do this thing. Um, he would do this thing called going stealth. So it didn't matter where we were. I think the first time I did it, we were, we, we happened to be in, in London and now he ran behind the thing was like this. It was like, what are you doing? He was like, so awesome. the whole group of us started going stealth through London. It was, it was crazy. So, and, and it, by the end, half the time his, um, his brother and sisters, again, they would do it with him too. And, and, uh, Half the time that it would be strangers would next thing you know you turn around and there's a stranger going. So they would join in and he was all about fun, um, but he was all about family. He was super serious when it came to family and, and friends. Um, if you were, if he was with his family or, or friends, um, that's who he's with. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a, um, you know, trying to be rude or. or you know, to, to fans or to other people, but he just recognized that, you know, hey, this is, this is my family time and uh, this is where my attention is. That's awesome. You talk about competitive now. I know we, we used to have some knockdown, drag out flag football games at REL every Sunday afternoon and Stu would show up dressed to the nines, wearing some tidy whiteies that only he could wear. He'd have his number 23 jersey on or his 32 Carolina jersey on and we would go to town. And when I left to go to Cleveland, he did a spoof tape on one of our Sunday afternoon football games. And to this day, I swear he was out of bounds. And he, and he says he was not. But I'm thinking, here's this guy at ESPN doing some spoof of a flag football game. He had to get a director, an audio guy, a camera operator. The lights had to be turned on. Uh, the, he had to go up on the set and do this. And I'm like, how many people do that? Isn't that on YouTube now? It is on I YouTube, just, I've yes. I've seen it. It's, it it's, is. Good. Check and out it, YouTube. That and is, it's, it's really and he's funny. still out of bounds. <laughs> yeah. Still out of bounds. For the record. He was competitive. You know, for those of you, a lot of you sportscasters uh, are, work for a team. You broadcast for a team. It's okay for you to be a homer every now and then, Pete. But for those what of us, every now and then, every now and then, <laughs> okay. for, for people like Stuart Scott, you had to be impartial. Yeah, you have to be impartial. But you knew that Stuart Scott loved the North Carolina Tar Heels and the way he presented it. Somehow it was OK, wasn't it? I Absolutely. It was. <laughs> you okay you know where the fire was. You knew where the fire was. And I think it's most important. And for all of you out here involved in this business, if you don't have the fire in your belly, Forget about it. Yeah. Well, that late night with Roy that he always hosted was uh, a fantastic, fantastic program. He always loved doing that. That was his favorite. I, I want to close what we're talking about with Stuart Scott, and we could literally go all night here. We heard him say this at the ESPYs, but it, I think, has impact and been a rallying cry for millions of cancer patients. You beat cancer by how you live. I and mean, it just, I think that resonates with so many people. And that was Stuart Scott, wasn't it? Yeah, well, one of my dear friends, Steve Burns. Uh, yes. Michael, we were talking about him. Steve Burns passed earlier this year. And uh, Steve took a lot of inspiration from Stu, though they had only met one or two times. And, and really, they weren't, they weren't friends. But he drew so much inspiration for that. And I remember uh, Steve calling me the night of the ESPYs. Mm -hmm. and telling me, did you hear what he just said? And I said, yeah. And, and Steve goes, well, that's damn right. Mm -hmm. And, that's, and right. That's, that's how Steve approached it until the very end. And it was, um, uh, you know, Steve was a hard nut to crack sometimes, but he, he saw a lot of inspiration in someone that, that he never met but related to. You know, Mike, you mentioned his love for North Carolina, but he had the ultimate respect for the Duke and NC State basketball yes, programs yeah. having worked in the triangle. And I remember specifically him talking about Jim Valvano and his bout with cancer and Kay Yao and her battle with cancer. And this was before Stu had his cancer. And I think he drew strength from them. And now we can all draw strength through him. And I think 
there are certain people that we all run across, whether we know them or whether we've just seen them or whether we've just read what they've written, that their struggles we draw strength in. And I don't think anybody in this room has not drawn strength from our man Stu. Yeah, the crazy thing is after that SB speech, and, um, and uh, thankfully I, w- I was there, and um, I got back the next day, and so did he, and he called me, and I was like, it was amazing. You know, what's going on? And he's like, really? I mean, he was unsure. Mm-hmm. He was like, I don't know. I mean, really? And I was like, are you kidding me? That was amazing. And I just, I don't, I think he would have been so overwhelmed um, after his passing at the, just the, the outpouring and the, um, just, just the love that was there. And, and like you said, he's inspired so many people. Um, and, and once he started tweeting, I think he got a little bit of sense of that because he was like, oh my gosh, people are like, you know, responding to me on this Twitter thing. And, um, and, and that, he actually drew strength from them um, through that. And uh, he was very vocal about, you know, just people that he didn't know helping him. So. Well, I, th- I think you'll all agree. Jay, do you have something? Well, I, I was just going to say, I saw him that morning uh, in Los Angeles with his guys, and they just finished working out and talked about how he just push busted up, up 300 push-ups. Yes. Push-up poker. And I, 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 <laughs> Amazing. I think I may have done 300 push-ups last year. <laughs> and I, I, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I was just in awe, especially when I saw him later that night. And I still am every day. I cannot and I do not have a bad day at work or just a bad day period. I can't because of him. Because I'd be letting him down if I did. There's always something I can do. There's always some place I can go. There's always something I can say because of him. I don't have a choice. And I have to say too, um, through Sam um, Mills's cancer with that Super Bowl year, um, I would tell Stuart, I was like, God, you know, Sam goes and gets chemo, goes and works out, and is in this office every day. And he's like, wow, that's, that's amazing, right? Fast forward however many years, um, he tells me when he, on, on the phone one night, he goes, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what Sam did. Yeah. And I was like, and, and he did. He did. Um, I, I've been to numerous chemo, chemo treatments with, with Stuart, and we went home and he had me doing stupid P90X (laughs) stuff. And I was like, I'm tired. But, uh, he, that was his thing. He, he wanted to work out after every, every treatment. And you're right. He just, I mean, to the, to the bitter end, he, he fought. I hear you. And I think, uh, we can see that Stuart Scott left not only a legacy on our business, but he left a, a legacy for millions of people who are fighting cancer. And I think it's been, uh, uh, really neat tonight to honor two people who have left a legacy on our business, Stuart Scott, certainly as a sports anchor, and Rune Arledge for changing the face of television sports. Thanks to all our panel here tonight. It's been a great thing.